Welcome to the Restitutor Orbis channel and thank you for joining me for our exploration today into the ancient enemy. In our explorations we've come across the question of what happened to the civilizations that preceded ours, and that includes the mainstream. The mainstream indicates that civilizations that preceded ours fell, but who is the ancient enemy? Is it something that's external or is it something internal? Is the ancient enemy something that's deep within our hearts and our souls? or? Is it an external threat, an existential threat that constantly reappears every so often? Let's find out. We go back to the five eras theory, and we know that in the previous eras, each of the civilizations in our five eras theory ended for a variety of reasons. We state that this is a major or a hard reset. A hard reset because something changed that caused the civilization to fall. Oftentimes we point to the presence of an ancient enemy. But what is the ancient enemy truly? Is it something that's external? Or is it something that's found within each human being? Or is it something that's both? One of the theories goes is that the previous era, the fourth era or the Tartarian age or civilization that preceded ours, was destroyed by some sort of enemy that appeared. This enemy was initially an external enemy, but then it became an internal enemy. Oftentimes, people tell you simply to follow the money. They just say, follow the money, and it will lead you to the root of all the forces that control civilization. And this refers to our current era. Did something happen in the previous era, though? What did the news tell us? News tells us to think what we tell you. We're all in this together. Do not question authority. Do as you're told, and you'll be left alone. And oftentimes we have things such as demons are scary and shapeshifters are very scary. What's the point behind all this? They seem to be intending to generate a lot of fear. And fear is something that is something that is existential and it's also ideal. In other words, there is a real physical fear that something terrible can happen to you. But at the same time, it's also the idea of fear. The idea of an uncertainty. It's the ideas of uncertainty that oftentimes compel us to action. Remember in the film The Matrix when they talked about the red pill and the blue pill. So what happened to the previous civilization? We believe that an external force appeared and the previous civilization managed to defeat it initially during its height. But then this external force changed its tactics and preyed upon the internal weaknesses that had existed in many of the people of this civilization. Now what were these internal weaknesses? That's what we're going to be exploring. We know in our own current civilization, we believe that all roads lead to the money and the control of money and the influence of money. But it's a little bit more complicated than that because while you can say that if you follow the money, you'll be able to determine who's really in control, is that really the reality that we face or is that merely the appearance of the reality that we face? We're told in many nations that our politicians have final control over the money supply. They can increase the debt ceiling. They can borrow more money without any fear of limitations and their banks or their national power will support them in doing this. And on the surface, this appears to be the truth. But what does this really reflect? Who actually has control? The legislatures, the executives, the judicial branches of these various governments. And of course, we're told that some nations have supposed democracies, others have constitutional republics, others have parliaments, and others operate under dictatorships. But the answer always seems to be the same, just follow the money is what everyone will tell us. Money will explain to you who's in control and how they have control. However, is the supply of money finite, or is money even real? I remember what actor Jeremy Irons said in the movie Margin Call when he stated, it's just money, it's not even real. Just pictures printed on paper so we don't kill each other for dinner or breakfast. Yet this idea exists for all of us as our primary force of control. We all know that we have to operate within the facet of money in order to achieve our existence. But do we have control over money? Or does money really control us? It's always a question that we ask, and people always think that you can follow this rabbit hole down and you'll be able to ascertain exactly who has total influence and control over the money. We know that some people are reliant on their paychecks, and other people can simply type a number in the computer, and they've created $100,000, or 100,000 dinar, or whatever currency you're dealing in. It's a constant contest 
between understanding what the system truly is and what the system can really be. We're dissuaded from asking these questions. And it goes back to what I showed with the news report. Do as you're told and you'll be left alone. Simply comply. It's always easy to comply. It's always easier to consent. It's the path of least resistance. Work a job. And if you want to affect change, then become a politician. All these roads are open to you, at least in certain nations. However, I want you to consider something else. Levels of awareness are means of control. We're only aware of one level, the level of money, where you have to work a job, you have politicians that supposedly have influence over a system, but those politicians can be bought, and yes, that includes dictators. You believe that banks have control over the money supply, and yet there seem to be other forces that may control the banks that we're not aware of. You can follow this all down to achieve the ultimate theory as to one family or one group of families that may have total control over the world. But is this really the way it is, or is this simply one level? Consider that there may be other levels of control that we can't observe. One of our greatest misconceptions, I believe, is that the forces that operate against us in the world have to disclose these things to us. But where is that written as a hard and fast rule? Why would the ancient enemy ever play by the same rules that we do? Perhaps this is merely a misconception that they wish to cultivate, so that we believe that we can determine who's really in control. But we don't see that there are other levels of control that we're not even aware of. And we're going to explore what those other levels of control can be. Yes, you can follow the money, and yes, you can determine or come up with theories in terms of who's in control, simply by following the money. And it may give you an idea. But consider the fact that that's only one level of control. Go up to the next level. What exactly is this physical control? And then another level beyond that, spiritual control. How does that work and what's that all about? There may be many more levels, even above spiritual control. But those are speculated. We'll just stick with these three levels for right now. Consider the existence of Cthulhu, an ultimate evil, something that was posited by H.P. Lovecraft in his works. And yes, we consider the works of horror fiction and science fiction because those ideas were inspired from somewhere. The interesting thing about Cthulhu is it's an ultimate evil that's able to inflict horror, terror, and destruction on a worldwide scale. It's something that has ultimate control and comes from another realm. The Dark Ones, the Deep Ones, the Ancient Ones. All the different names and all the greatest fears that human beings have ever had. Not just in this civilization, but all the previous civilizations. And whether you go off the mainstream account or alternate research, there have always been adversaries such as these. Every religion seems to have a devil, and every form seems to have some sort of evil, or an ancient evil. However, when we really examine the nature of evil, how often is it that something is truly evil, or is it simply evil because we're told it is evil? We're always told and compelled and incessantly reinforced that we have immediate threats and that we have to act to immediately alleviate those threats. And you can see this from any perspective, whether you're defending your nation or you're defending your own personal welfare in life. Yet Cthulhu is interesting because Cthulhu supposedly has the ability to influence and affect people on the inside. And what does that really mean? It has the ability to change the way people think and operate and believe. And that's why Cthulhu is considered such a dangerous enemy. An ancient enemy that we like to believe that has all this power. But if such an adversary truly exists, and there was this kind of power, how would we even be capable of questioning it? How could a video like this even be made? How could other videos by other content creators that openly question this be made? And there may be an answer. Maybe that's simply what it wants. Maybe it simply wants us to constantly flop around and come up with different theories and utilize our time. We also consider another Lovecraftian creation, the Mygo. A terrifying creature, perhaps even more terrifying than the very large and godlike Cthulhu. The Mygo were an alien creature, and they specialized in feeding on human beings. Even more terrifying, they specialized in experimenting on human beings. And perhaps this is something that you could see with the physical control element. Imagine if there's some sort of force out there that can't be perceived and has the capability of imposing physical control on human beings. It does so by physical pain. It does so by changing the physical nature of human beings. 
The terrifying aspect of the Maigo was a body horror element, where they could simply remove people's brains and keep them alive. It seems a little cliche now, but when this was new, back in the 1930s and 1940s, this was a terrifying idea to many people. This was considered the very classic aspects of horror. And a lot of people view and see Lovecraft as the ultimate master of true horror. And for this very reason, that the physical control that can be in place on human beings to where they completely lose their will is something that's beyond our darkest nightmares. And yet at the same time, we're very well aware of it. We're capable of imagining it and considering it. And therefore, as terrifying as the Maigo may be, they probably are not the ultimate form of what we might consider the ancient evil. But they could represent some aspect of it. Now, am I saying that in one of the past civilizations there was some sort of creature like the Maigo that came and infiltrated the society? Well, anything's possible. But I think there's something even more darker and more insidious that could have been much more likely. Because even a creature such as the parasitic Maigo can be seen, and they could be detected, and very likely they could be defended against. However, consider the fact that there might be other forces or other creatures that would not so easily be defended against. It was really more the idea of the Maigo that induced fear within people. And it's oftentimes inducing fear that leads to a lot of control. Because it's simply the fear of what may or may not happen. Or not even the existential fear, but the idea of fear that can be used to achieve control on people. So the Maigo exists as something that is a warning. A warning of some sort of external force that could impose physical control over people against their will and force them to do their bidding, while at the same time continuing to inflict eternal torment. And now we go to the origin of all the snake cults, or the natural human fear of snakes, serpents, and reptiles. The natural fear of serpents, a lot of people will tell you, is instinctive. And yet at the same time, famous scientists such as Carl Sagan will tell us that we have a reptilian portion of our brain because of our evolution. Our evolution means that we may have once resembled creatures like this. Now, to be fair, he doesn't show this in his evolution animations. But he does give indications and he does very clearly state that we have a reptilian side of our brain. In the past, could there have been snakemen creatures like this? Anything's possible. Yet, once again, this is something else that alludes to the idea of an ancient evil. The idea of an evil of serpents that have been with us for all time. We also look at some of the base symbols in religions and in other aspects of society. We'll see that the serpent is very firmly represented. At the same time, you'll even see the serpent in other locations, such as in the medical symbol, interestingly enough. Some people are terrified of serpents and snakes, and other people find them charming and wonderful pets to have. And all you need to do is go down to Florida and go through the Everglades, and you'll find no shortage of Burmese pythons, released as former pets and now an invasive species in the Everglades. We come back to this idea, though, of why the serpents can induce terror in some people and why other people venerate them, even worship them, because, once again, you can find no shortage of some certain religious groups who worship the serpent. It has a dual meaning. It can be seen as a power, which people respect, and it even refers back to the god of Set, which is featured in many different pulp fiction stories. And we also see it reflected in many movies. And even as recently as He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. And I'm talking about the second iteration. Well, actually, I believe it'd be the third iteration. That came out in the early 2000s. Where they talked about the Snake Men. And the fact that Snake Mountain was actually the petrified or frozen god of the snakes. We always see snakes and we wonder if they represent the ancient evil that's always been with us. Because of their reference in many different biblical texts and other religions. Yet we also have to consider that there's another perception, that snakes really aren't so evil and there's something to be venerated. So what's the final conclusion with snakes? It seems as though it depends on the society and the people. Some live in great fear of them, some have a natural instinctive fear of them, and others see them as companions, others see them as an element of power or an element of something that shows wisdom even. 
What do you think they really represent? Let me know in the comments. It's safe to say that there is a lot of snake symbolism that's been with our culture and our society and very likely with previous civilizations. And we'll be told that the mainstream that the snake was very much venerated by previous civilizations. Why exactly do they do that? Is that from official studies or is there some other reason for telling us that? You'll see no shortage of imagery that shows what kind of power the serpent could have and why it was actually venerated as an aspect of life. And yet other civilizations feared the serpent and stated that it had the power to consume all life on the lands and across the world. It's a symbol, it's a demon, and yet to others, it's a god. So is this some way to determine what the natural inclination of certain human beings are? Or do people simply have different backgrounds and do they simply look at serpents differently depending on where they come from and what they're really raised to believe? It's hard to say. I will say that based on my own background, that serpents are considered evil, threatening creatures. And in the course of my lifetime, I've never been personally afraid of serpents when I've come across them. They're just animals to me, like many other animals, to be respected. And at the same time, they do reference serpents in terms of dragons. And considering this fantasy approach, we oftentimes hear of how dragons are related to great serpents or giant worms. The words and the terms are used interchangeably. So could this be some sort of memory that's endured with us? We don't know. We move on finally to the Hyperion series. This is a science fiction series written by Dan Simmons that posited a utopian society in the future. And this utopian society was capable of space travel. And they had a wonderful set of society with many different cultures that were amalgamated and working together. Yet at the same time, there was a devastating evil on the planet Hyperion. An evil that consisted of a killer angel called the Shrike, and also the terrifying creatures of the Cruciform. And we'll explore the Cruciform. The Cruciform was a creature that would attach itself to the human body and acted as a parasite. And yet over time, the longer one was exposed to a Cruciform, their bodies would begin to denigrate and degenerate and lose their identity losing their identity as an individual person in every way, shape, and form. The only way a cruciform could be removed from the body was if the Shrike, the angel that existed on the planet Hyperion, would remove it. Now, how exactly does this relate back to our ancient enemy in the old world? Consider the fact that in the story of Hyperion, the cruciform was captured by the society, it was studied, and they managed to scientifically alter it because one of the other side effects of the cruciform was that it would provide eternal life. Now, this is just what the story says. I'm not passing any judgments, but in the far future, the Catholic Church ultimately uses the cruciform and bestows a cruciform on a person in which they're able to remove the effects of taking away the individuality, and the cruciform enables the person to live forever. The only catch is you have to convert to the Catholic Church, and that's one of the main plot elements in the story of Hyperion. Now consider, in the past, if there was such a thing as a cruciform, that utilizing the promise of eternal life was used as a means of encouraging people to conform, to consent, to a particular power. Here we see the Shrike engaged in battle and how terrifying it could really be, this killer angel. But ultimately this was not the greatest threat in the story of Hyperion. The cruciform was the greatest threat. An external threat can kill, but an internal threat can control. The cruciform represented both. It was a parasitic creature that attached itself to your body, and once, once attached, there was no way to remove it. There were a couple ways, but usually they would kill the patient. And the only way it could be removed without killing the patient is with the shrike, which is the creature depicted here. In the past, something such as the cruciform may have been used to achieve control on people, and people desiring eternal life and desiring a life free of struggle and strife may well have accepted this, all at the cost of forfeiting their individuality. And there's a reason why the cruciform in its presence is considered one of the most terrifying entities, 
more terrifying than Cthulhu, more terrifying than the Mygo and their external body horror threats. And the reason for that being is we oftentimes see what the true ancient evil is. We start to get an idea of what it's really all about. It's not about all these external threats, all these terrifying monsters and apparitions of snakes and large creatures that can destroy entire lands and entire worlds. It's really about the ability to inflict control on human beings. The ability to use terror and fear to constantly compel people to do that which they may not do without it. And we see this in every approach, and this is something we see throughout our daily lives. And all you have to do is watch the news and you'll be told what you're supposed to be afraid of. You'll be told what you're supposed to think. And you'll be told what it is you're supposed to conform to. Therefore, you can be alleviated of this fear. Yet at the same time, we can also see what this leads to. This leads to a complete forfeiture of individuality. This leads to the desecration and destruction of any of our own dreams or desires. It is not existing in a balance with society where the society supports the individual and the individual supports the society. This is a society that requires the individual to sacrifice everything to support it. And it achieves this by the promise of eternal life, by the promise of benefits. Or now, as it's evolved into, the simple promise that things will not be worse. Things will not be as bad as they were in the past. Because it's never about making things better in the future. It's always about... You don't want to descend to how bad things were in the past. How many times are we told that every day? And how many lands are people told that every day? That yes, you may have to sacrifice something. You may have to accept a decrease in the quality of life. But it's still so much better than it was in the distant past. We're never going to descend to how things were hundreds of years ago. Yet at the same time, this is why we have to question what the actual account of the past is. Because the account of the past, whether it's true or not, is used as an element of fear to achieve control. Why do we talk about the cruciform? Because it's an analogy. It's an analogy for how we wish to live an easy life, how we wish to reach our goals. But what are we really willing to sacrifice? And do we ever question that which we're willing to sacrifice in order to achieve our goals? Everybody fears death, whether they know it or not, whether they consciously think on it or not. But because of that powerful impulse and that desire to avoid death. The ultimate irony from the Hyperion story is that the Catholic Church, which promised eternal salvation once you died, ultimately guaranteed eternal salvation by preventing people from dying by attaching this cruciform parasitic entity to their bodies. Did something like this happen in the past? Was this a way in which the previous civilization may have been subverted, it may have been turned against itself, I think there's a lot of inclinations that while this might not have been the exact method, something very similar to this happened. This could well have been the alternate approach that some sort of external force was finally able to use to destroy previous civilizations. And it's safe to say that this ancient enemy could well still be with us to this day, it just operates in a different manner than it did in the past. And yet, it still looks to achieve the same ends, the same goals. What it all comes down to is us, every individual. And how is it that we resist something like this? Well, think about what you go through in your daily life. Ultimately, you have to decide what your goals are, and you have to decide what you're willing to make compromises on. Where and what do you grant consent to? Now, it's safe to say there are people out there that want to help you, and there are people out there that don't care to help you, and they wish to hinder you. You have to ask yourself, are people really trying to do either, or are they simply trying to influence you and control you? And if they are, what's the best means to resist that? Because if you have that kind of awareness, it's very easy to resist it. You simply ignore it. You don't have to be rude to people. You don't have to act in a violent manner at all. You simply have to have awareness. Is removing consent that simple? Is resisting the ancient evil that simple? Yes, I think there are a lot of indications that it is, and it could be. 
Why do you think so much time is spent on getting us to focus on money, on getting us to focus on fears? Fear of being broken, fear of living in a worse state than people did in the past. Or fear of what may happen in the future if we don't conform to what we're supposed to conform to. It all comes down to the fact that there are three levels of control and there may be more levels of control. You're able to see level one and you can follow it all down to every theory that you have, perhaps even determining there may be existing conspiracies. But what does it really matter if there's another level of control that you can't see? That there are some individuals that are controlled through physical means who don't operate with the limitations of money. And then individuals who are controlled through a spiritual means who don't operate through either money or physical influences. Consider that. At last, we turn to the example of Spartacus. Spartacus, a movie from 1960 starring Kirk Douglas as the Thracian slave, we're told in the opening narration that Spartacus was sold into slavery by his mother when he was 13. Or actually, I should say he was born into slavery as his mother was a slave. And by the age of 13, he became a slave. But he grew up proud and rebellious. Yet, the narration also tells us that he went through his entire young adult life. I believe Kirk Douglas was in his late 30s or 40 when this was filmed. And finally, after accepting slavery for a couple decades, he reaches his breaking point when a friend collapses and he attacks a Roman guard. Now, the movie would have been over if the Roman guard just pulled out his gladius and stabbed him, which we would expect to happen. Yet, our official history also tells us that this led to a great uh, slave revolt, which the Romans finally crushed. Now, why do I bring this example up? This example of Spartacus is that he consented to this kind of control for 20 years. We're supposed to believe that he was rebellious and strong-willed, and yet he was willing to be a slave for 20 years and didn't reach his breaking point until after 20 years. Now I know you're just going to tell me it's a film. Of course it is. But consider this. Slavery is evil because people don't have the opportunity to consent. They're forced to do it. And yet in the modern era, you are given consent to anything. And therefore it's not slavery, and therefore it's okay. Consider the example of indentured service. The means that was once used to pay for passage to the New World, or from Europe to North America, or so we're told, and consider that now it's not indentured service, you consider it a loan if you want to go to Mars someday. Whatever you believe about the veracity of the ability to go to Mars, the fact that they're still offering this, and the fact that it still exists, shows us what the ancient enemy is. The ancient enemy is within us. It is giving consent through apathy. Well, thank you for joining me. Cathedrals. It's in the study of cathedrals that we find so many inspirations for the greatest achievements of humanity. Cathedrals always inspire us. They cause us to question things internally. And they're also wonderful edifices for us to give glory to the higher being, the highest being, if you will. Yet at the same time, we can use cathedrals as definitive proof that there's something more to our society, that the reality is these cathedrals are evidence of alternate realities. Greetings. Why does this cathedral warn our attention? What is so incredible about it? Well, first we notice its remarkable size, the fact that this is a mammoth building and it stands out on this very interesting precipice of a hill. We see how it compares to the cars nearby. We also see the elaborate and ornate architecture. We would expect a cathedral like this to be found in Europe somewhere. Perhaps Italy or France. And would you be surprised to know that this cathedral is not located in Europe or Central Asia. This cathedral is located in Minnesota. St. Paul, Minnesota completed this cathedral. Let's take a look at its background. St. Paul, Minnesota, 1850 to 1915. Now, we're told that St. Paul was settled very recently, and during the Civil War, somehow Minnesota managed to contribute many soldiers to the Union cause and simultaneously fight a Native American uprising called the Dakota War in the 1860s. 
During that time, they had a requirement for a new cathedral, and we see this second cathedral that was built in the bottom. The first one's in the top right, which was just a very modest wooden shack, really, which is what we'd expect. And yet we find this built-out cathedral from the mid-19th century. Most impressive religious structure west of Chicago, 175 by 100 feet, and it boasted a steeple 250 feet high. However, in the financial panic of 1857, all work on it stopped. Isn't that interesting? A financial panic actually stopped work on the cathedral, because normally it never stops work on other buildings. Well, it turned out that as the rapid growth of St. Paul in Minneapolis during the 19th century was occurring, Archbishop John Ireland inherited the idea to build an even greater cathedral because what they had down there was not good enough. So in 1903, he found a couple prominent local businessmen who just contributed the land, obviously out of about a piety, and everything was falling together for building this amazing temple on the plains, as they called it. Now the plan for building this cathedral came together very quickly for Archbishop Ireland. 205 laymen and 100 priests from the area gathered to make the initiatory step towards realization of the great project. He then named 12 laymen and 6 clergymen to the executive building committee. Then they recruited Emmanuel Louis Mascari to design the cathedral, our architect extraordinaire. If you don't know, Mr. Mascari was actually the chief architect of the St. Louis World's Fair. Nothing suspicious about that. They laid the cornerstone on June 2, 1907 in a grand celebration attended by more than 60,000 people. Quite a cornerstone laying ceremony. We have a picture of it, believe it or not. And he decided the first Mass was going to be held on Easter Sunday, 1915. So, eight short years to throw up this massive masonry-constructed cathedral. Shortly after it was completed, though, Ireland and Mosquery died, and everything came together as a divine act. You know, I'm not surprised that they just don't say that it was a divine act, that this incredible cathedral is there. Now we take a look at how fast St. Paul and Minneapolis grew as cities, and for comparison, we also have North Dakota, which is to the west of this urban area in Minnesota. St. Paul had 20,000 people in 1870, and by 1910, it had grown to 214,000 people. Minneapolis started with 13,000 in 1870, and by 1910, it had grown to 301,000. Massive growth. At the same time, North Dakota, which is further west of this urban area, the next adjacent state, they started with 2,400 people in 1870, and by 1910, they had nearly 600,000. Massive growth. And this will be explained by the fact that there was immigration coming to the United States. They say that 15 million people immigrated to the United States from 1900 to 1910. I can't imagine why people would want to leave Europe, though, at the start of the 20th century. All those great social reforms were finally implemented. Things were looking good. And you already had a built-up infrastructure in Europe. But I'd rather go to the United States to live a hard life because there's opportunity there. Even though we're told that all these robber barons were well-known, such as the Vanderbilts and all the other people of prominence who really controlled the nation. There was also uh, Native Americans that were still out and still causing trouble, although somehow they were magically subdued in 1890. It all happens together in a very short amount of time. The things they could achieve at the end of the 19th century and the early 20th century, it boggles the mind. Now we'll look at some construction photographs of this incredible cathedral from 1907 to 1915. And here we see our foundation construction, I suppose. Isn't it interesting how we never see anything ever dug up and apparently there's no need to show anything being dug up. I always find it remarkable that there's no use of heavy machinery in any of these photos. They did this all with manual labor, horses, and then some very rudimentary cranes, it looks like, in the early 20th century. Quite an achievement. Then we look at this photo and we see the construction of the base of the cathedral. Isn't it amazing how level they kept the construction with all these large blocks? Although, when we look at other photos of construction, we'll notice that they try to give us the impression that these blocks are filled with bricks. And yet, when you actually go to this cathedral and you knock on the blocks, much as when you go to many state capitals, you'll find that they are hard blocks. They're very inspiring structures, and anyone who tries to tell you that it's just a church or it's just a state capital clearly doesn't see things very clearly. Here's an interior construction photo. Look at this. We don't even seem to have a floor completed. We supposedly already have a foundation built, and it's built deep in the ground, and yet they're showing these photos, and this is where you see the bricks, where they're trying to depict the fact that it's being built up without a floor. What they do, install the solid floor later, because that was just so easy to do? These photos seem to raise more questions than they answer, as is always the case. I always find it interesting that we never have a solid point of 
perception or one perspective for construction photos. So they could plan out the building of this immense cathedral and yet they couldn't document it very efficiently or effectively or consistently. Nope, no reason to ask questions on that. And here you see the scaffolding and some of the scaffolding on the inside. Yet another photo which seems to defy the reasons of scale. I don't know. These construction photos just really baffle the mind, as is there no doubt intended to. And here's the completion of the cathedral in another very non-questionable photo, of course. Looks as though they just coated it with stucco. And they're still supposedly working on the top spire of the cathedral, which is coated in copper, supposedly, today. Although, who knows what it was originally made out of. I still wonder about the scale, though, with this photo. And why does this photo seem very strange, especially the fact that it seems to be cross-cut? This is one of the very beautiful Victorian, or Second Empire, or whatever architectural style you want to use, houses that they demolished to build the cathedral. Nice, beautiful, old-worlder. I wonder why they had those elaborate covers over the top of the windows. Is that so you could stick your head out the window and not be hit by snow and hail in Minnesota? Beautiful chimney, too, and someone asked me why I focus so much on chimneys. Well, that's because why do you need a beautiful, ornate chimney and a fireplace if you're just cooking and heating your home? Here's our interior photo of the cathedral and looking at all the beautiful decorative detail that they have on the inside. And then looking again, see, you don't see these small bricks. These are very large blocks. And this is something that really shows you the beautiful and intricate detail that they went about in constructing the interior of the cathedral. And that's probably why we never see any very convincing interior construction photos. When you see the arches and the dome. Because why would anybody want to show photos of that? And don't tell me they were too hard to capture photos of that. And then other people say, well, you see the scaffolding. The scaffolding proves everything. Of course. And there's scaffolding whenever they renovate a building. Does that prove construction of the building? Look at the beautiful dome and all the detail and effort that went into it. And they're saying that they completed this decor decoration and the efforts behind it in under a year. I'm having a little bit of trouble believing that. But if you want to believe it, and that's what the official historical account says, and if you want to believe official historical accounts, that's your prerogative. I'm really pointing out another means of questioning things, which I believe is always important. I also want to point out the back of the cathedral, where you see all these small domes and these subsidiary domes that are built in the larger dome. This almost gives reminders of the Hagia Sophia. Interestingly enough, the construction time of the Hagia Sophia is said to be less than this beautiful cathedral, and it was done during the 530s, which also included the worst year in history, which historians will never fail to remind you of, especially in light of recent events, such as 2020. I can't imagine why they'd need to do that. There was nothing terrible in 2020. We're all still here. I'm not sure how that happened. Nevertheless, very beautiful, and you see the way that this falls together. Oh, yes, there's also a beautiful monument out in front of this cathedral. Another Civil War monument, it would appear, although at its base it's a beautiful obelisk or a column that's built up, and you can actually see in some of the other construction photos of this beautiful cathedral that we'll be looking at, that that column was already there. So it makes me wonder, was the cathedral already there? What exactly is going on here? And why do we continuously get more questions and answers? So let's go to CBS News and look at our account of the cathedral 100 years in time, the history of it. And these were the designs that were submitted by our brilliant architect, Masquerade, or Masquerade might be a better name for him. And I don't mean to castigate fun at the individual, but I wonder how real is all this? Second design, 1905. And the third design, ah, it took him three tries and he got it. Are these designs or are these sketches? <laughs> no, they're designs. Of course, that's what they'll call them. What else would they call them? Oh, and then we get a final profile. And I suppose that's showing a cutaway. It reminds me of the wonderful works done by other French architects when they were... <laughs> designing or documenting things in the 18th century. And there's the floor plan in 1906. Threw it together all very nicely. And here's another construction photo in 1906. And look at that again. We don't see any actual excavation. We just see some horses with wagons and everyone kind of standing around like we typically do. 
Looks like a big mess. Reminds me of the Iowa State Capitol construction photos. Oh, here we have a construction of the substructure. It's not a foundation, it's a substructure. I like how it looks like you've got three individuals that are doing something here and someone just standing here with their hands behind their back. And everyone just seems to be lollygagging around. Yes, does this photo really prove anything? No, I don't think so. Oh, laying of the cornerstone in 1907. Yes, this is what really got everything kicked off, where 60,000 people were attending. I guess that could be 60,000 people. I mean, what else did everybody have to do at the start of the 20th century, you know, aside from work? Because I'm told by many people that everybody had to work or they starved and died. Except for these people, apparently. Look how well-dressed everyone is. And I really enjoy the individual who's just riding the cornerstone. And there you see the little monument in the background, already constructed and already completed, naturally. Oh, here we go. Construction of the brick walls in 1908. So is this in the foundation? It looks like these walls have already been here for quite a long time, even though they're only a year old. And why are they just building brick walls down here? It's as though they want to give us this impression that that's what they're doing. And remember that in Minnesota, you have many months of extreme cold and you can't actually work on the cathedral. So keep that in mind when you're looking at this very compressed timeline to build this amazing masonry edifice. And here we go. Another construction photo. Oh, I like this. Moscare viewing the cathedral construction site, winter 1910 to 1911. So obviously they'd stop work for the winter, but then the chief architect himself decided to come by and pay a little visit. And we get this really bizarre photo of him just sitting there, not actually talking to anybody, not actually reviewing anything, just sitting there. Look, here's a close up. There he is. He kind of looks like Tyrone Power. Look at those eyebrows. Was this just some individual who was just moseying around the construction site, or if there really was a construction site, and then just decided to pop a squat right there for hanging out in the cold? Now to show him smoking a cigarette. Why is he not wearing gloves? He's got his hands in his pocket. Is this really Moscare? I don't know. Oh, here we go. More construction photos, and yes, this doesn't look suspicious at all, does it? No, not at all. Oh, and the facade, and of course we have our scaffolding. Why they need scaffolding? They'd already lifted the blocks in place. That doesn't make any sense. Well, don't ask questions. Just take it as it is. And again, all these construction photos are not from one perspective. If these are legitimate construction photos, they did a very lousy job documenting this because they could have documented this from one single perspective and showed progress on the building. You would think that someone like Mascare would want to do that, but apparently he had no concerns. He just sat out there in the cold and watched it. And then, of course, you see a scaling issue between these individuals right here on this handrail as opposed to the cathedral. Strange. Look at the blocks right there below the handrail. Hmm. I just don't know what to think. Uh, and there's the construction of the mighty copper dome. And, of course, we have that tight scaffolding up there and all the internal structure. But I thought it was a masonry structure. So why do you need that? Well, you let me know. This looks like it was drawn in. Doesn't look real to me. And everyone's just hanging around there with the lantern, having a grand old time, and they just hauled it all up there. Near completion, of course, because they tell us. And then you see the blocks again here. Window hasn't been filled in yet, supposedly, but it's all dark. I don't know. Strange photos. Oh, and here are the interior when they haven't finished it. Something looks off with this photo as well. So you don't even see the blocks. It's as though they just have uh, standard walls in there. But if you actually go in that cathedral and you knock on the walls, those are all hard blocks, large, hard blocks. It doesn't look like that at all. And there she is, the new cathedral done in the spring of 1915. So yes, this is our official documentation from a trusted news source. What do you think? Cathedrals are always a tripping point, though, for many alternative researchers, and the reason for that is because this footage of this one worker renovating St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City was apparently enough to cause other alternative researchers to suddenly question all their research, even going so far as to call the people who had followed their research fools and idiots. Never trust people who call you a fool or idiot because they're simply castigating you for not accepting the mainstream account, or in other words, you're not indoctrinated enough. Take it as a compliment if one of those people calls you an idiot or a fool. This is animated footage of one individual who supposedly built a castle all by themselves in Colorado, and I'll attach a link for it at the end of the video. Yes, they use animated footage to show how this castle was constructed. And there's some people who cite this as proof that this shows how people can build and achieve anything. Well, it doesn't really prove anything to me. 
And when you look at this photograph, you see that the individual has their child supposedly helping them, although it looks like the walls are already constructed. So who knows? Go ahead and take a look at the video on your own and come to your own conclusions. I also highlight Coral Castle in Florida that was built by one single individual. And yet to this day, they've never been able to really tell us how one individual constructed a castle. Could it be possible maybe these respective individuals found existing structures and then improved them? I don't know. Watch the video and decide for yourself. So for our second part of this exploration, we're going to examine Rochester and the founding of the Mayo Clinic. So we were just up here in Minneapolis and St. Paul looking at the Cathedral of St. Paul. And now we're going to Rochester. Rochester is down here in southeast Minnesota, kind of in the middle of nowhere. So the question might be asked, why did the Mayo Clinic end up in Rochester? There's a very interesting history with Rochester because the city really wasn't going anywhere. It wasn't really that large in the 1880s. And apparently William Morrill Mayo, who was a surgeon trained by geniuses in the United Kingdom, ended up in Rochester. And the reason he ended up in Rochester was apparently they were mustering Union troops there for the Civil War, and that's where he conducted medical examinations on them before sending them off to fight. There's also the interesting fact that most of the Minnesota regiments ended up fighting in the Eastern Theater of the United States Civil War, not the Western Theater, as the Iowa regiments did, the state of the South. Regardless, William Morrow Mayo set up shop in Rochester with his sons, and there was no hospital there. Until the town was hit by a tornado, does this sound familiar, in the early 1880s. And then in 1889, with help from the brilliant Sisters of St. Francis, who seemed to be everywhere in the Midwest, they founded a hospital. And we'll take a look at that. And then from there, they founded the Mayo Clinic. So yes, this town in the middle of nowhere, which just happens to be the capital of the Mayo Clinic, and frankly, they may as well just call it Mayo City or Mayo Clinic City and not call it Rochester. They could even call it MCC. Let's take a look at uh, the buildings that came as a result of Mayo's fortuitous presence in Rochester. So here's St. Mary's Hospital, founded in 1889 by the Mayo family, with help from the Sisters of St. Francis, of course. I always found it interesting, there was an episode of Little House in the Prairie where Mary, the eldest Ingalls' daughter, was hurt when she fell, or she fell out of the stable, and she needed an emergency surgery in Rochester, Minnesota. Now, keep in mind, this is well before 1889, and when they took her to Rochester, Minnesota, it was long before this hospital was quote-unquote founded. So, a nice little continuity error, but it shows how people believe that the Mayo Clinic has always been in Rochester. I wonder if it always has. In any event, we see that this hospital is a beautiful old world building from 1889, and it shows just how rapidly things developed in Rochester, Minnesota. You see the usual trappings of old world architecture with the special foundation blocks, and then of course the beautiful ornate entryway. This almost looks like a hospital that could potentially be pleasant to be at, and yet at the same time, we see reminders of the layout of asylums. Well, enough of that. Let's go on to the Plummer Building. So this was built in 1928, so only about 30 years after the hospital, and you go from that hospital to this incredible Art Deco building. This is Rochester, Minnesota's patented one and only Art Deco building, and it is an essential part of the Mayo Clinic. So apparently they upgraded from that hospital we just saw to this beautiful, ornate building. It has a very colored history to it as well because there's a postcard from 1922 that shows what the building looked like before the bell tower. So what is really going on? We take a closer look and we see that it's the classic Art Deco building with the beautiful figures on top of the tower and some amazing columns that were somehow completed in 1928. But again, there is that postcard from 1922. I'm not going to show the postcard, though, because you can look that up on your own, and it shows some beautiful contrast with the building. Regardless, I think it's important to realize, though, that why is there only one single Art Deco building in Rochester? And the naysayer will, of course, tell you because that was the plan from the start. They designed it, and that's what they really wanted. Of course they did. I still wonder, though, what if this building was already there? And why would that make a lot more sense in addition to the hospital already being there? And that's the real reason why Mayo decided to set up shop in Rochester. Of course, that's an absurd theory to even come up with. Yet, it's the only theory that seems to fit the facts. Because how did Mayo ever make his name as a surgeon if he was out in the middle of nowhere? Were people sending emails to other people? Were patients just going all over the country talking about what a great surgical experience they had with the Mayos? I don't know. It never made any sense to me. I love this figure right here. 
You could interpret this as a phoenix, a griffin. It looks like you have everything and beyond in this beautiful building. Why do they need a beautiful building like this for a hospital anyway? This, again, almost looks like a hospital I would actually appreciate being at. Look at the small columns and all the little blocks. This is the beautiful entryway. And then you also follow by looking at some of the interior of the building. And this is where its true beauty is to behold. And naturally, you'll never see any construction photos of how they achieve this. The floor, the walls, the beautiful ornate ceiling, the chandeliers. Remember, this is a hospital. Again, this would be a hospital I would actually be pleased to be at. Now, I read something about the Mayo Clinic that said that their doors are always open to welcome patients, and I can't help but wonder, was the Mayo Clinic open, or were the doors open in 2020 to 2021? I'm sure they were. Look at this. This is an absurd amount of beauty, detail, all for a hospital. And why is it only in this building? Rochester, Minnesota's one patented Art Deco building. There are no other Art Deco buildings in Rochester. Fortunately, this one still stands. And we see beauty that just defies the imagination. We see a building that you would feel inspired just to be in. Conversation pieces everywhere you look. Even the doors, the arches. It just doesn't stop. It keeps going. Why do we settle for less than this if we really had this capability? That's where we have to question the mainstream account. Speaking of, here's the Gonda building. This was built in the end of the 90s in the early 21st century. And I can remember driving through Rochester when they were building this. Yes, this is what we build now. Isn't it beautiful? Isn't it inspiring? Would you like to see what it looks like on the inside? Well, why not? What a hospital patient see today? Yes, this kind of beauty. Now, isn't this the kind of beauty that inspires you? I really love the yellow chairs. I wish I could see that more in hotels because that inspires me. So what am I really saying with this whole presentation with alternate realities? It's clear that someone is trying to present a very defined historical account and they want us to believe that historical account and that's why people will attack you by saying you're an idiot or you're uneducated by not simply believing the historical account or my favorite you didn't do good research well when you do good research and you apply objective reasoning you find that none of these accounts seem to make any sense and there's a lot of inconsistencies and then you even get conflicting accounts the fact that the Mayo Clinic is in Rochester doesn't make any sense. The Cathedral in St. Paul does not make any sense when you really break things down. So what's really going on? I think this is an indication that someone is trying to either change what really happened, or this could be an indication that there are other realities that may possibly overlap. Or it's all a great simulation. In any event, we're going to continue to explore and find answers. It's great to be back, and thank you for joining me. Welcome to the Restituto Orbis channel and thank you for joining me for today's exploration into High Brazil, the phantom island of Ireland. Is it a myth or reality? What is the allure of phantom islands and why do we have so many legends and myths of phantom islands? Are they real or are they just something from our imagination or something from poor cartography in the past and a vivid imagination of explorers who didn't exactly know what they were doing? Yet, somehow they were able to find their way around the world and chart it accurately and enable us to discover all the lands that were not discovered before, so the mainstream says. What is High Brazil and what's the allure behind it? Many myths and legends persist about High Brazil, that it's an island that can be seen from the western coast of Ireland once every seven years and you just barely see it poking its way out of a fog. Your imagination runs wild as you wonder about the incredible creatures and remarkable adventures that could be had on such an island. What's its connection to the past, and how does it factor into our old world theories? Yet when we look at images of islands obscured in fog, we think back to our own memories and wonder if there is something in our collective memory that does ring true about these kind of islands. What's really the mystery behind High Brazil? And what can we learn about ourselves by looking into it? We imagine what could actually be on the island, things that we couldn't even imagine before. Creatures, flora and fauna, perhaps even a civilization. 
High Brazil was said to be the Atlantis of Ireland. But what are the details behind this legend and myth? We go back to Mercator's map, and we recall that many of the lands didn't seem to be properly aligned, at least from what we understand from our modern understanding of how our realms or our lands look and are arrayed. But the other hand, they could be more accurate. And we have many islands that appear on Mercator's map. Many islands in many different places, some which were told, well, it was simply cartographic errors, Mercator didn't know what he was doing, the information that he got from the explorers was not validated and verified, they made mistakes, they didn't have proper navigation equipment, and so forth. However, when you look at this and you see that there are so many things that are accurate, you have to wonder if there's much more to the reality of the existence of these islands. We have many different maps depicting the location of High Brazil, just off to the west of Ireland, even in another Mercator map from 1623, and in other types of maps. It was seen and depicted in many different charts, and yet, what brought about this observation of this island, and why is there this persisting myth that it can only be seen every seven years, and shrouded in fog? Is there more behind this? Does this connect to previous old world legends that we've explored with Ireland? Well, this is what we're going to explore in detail. Let's see what Irish Central can tell us about this amazing mythical island. Does a mythical island really exist off the coast of Ireland? Imagination merges with reality where the island of High Brazil is remembered in both travelers' records and ancient Irish legends. High Brazil is referenced in both explorer's logs and Celtic mythology, but is it real? Imagination merges with reality where the island of High Brazil is remembered in both traveler's records and ancient Irish legends. Ireland could indeed have its own version of Atlantis. Information gathered by historian Fianna Brome, as well as Celtic mythological enthusiast, shows the intersection of myth and reality in regards to the island of High Brazil, which is also known by the variants of High Brazil, Hi Brazil, Hi Brazil, Brazil, among others. In Celtic folklore, this island country takes its name from Brazil, the High King of the World. An interesting connection, since we know for a fact that, according to the myths of Ireland, the King of the World, Dare Doan, attacked Ireland from the west. He rested for a while at Skellig Michael. But could this have been his gateway? or some sort of Ford staging base, where he assembled his army? Why would this island have this name? Intriguing. However, as the Atlantic began to be more thoroughly explored, the name of High Brazil may have been attached to a real place, providing some evidence that attached itself to the Irish myth. High Brazil was noted on maps as early as 1325, when Genie's cartographer Darlato placed the island west of Ireland. On successive sailing charts, it appears southwest of Galway Bay. Both St. Berend and St. Brendan found the island on their respective voyages and returned home with nearly identical descriptions of High Brazil, which they dubbed the Promised Land. A Catalan map of about 1480 labels an island as Ilha de Brazil to the southwest of Ireland, where the mythical place was supposed to be. Expeditions left Bristol in 1480 and 1481 to search for it, in a letter written shortly after the return of John Cabot from his expedition in 1497, reports that land found by Cabot had been discovered in the past by the men from Bristol who found High Brazil. Some historians claim that the navigator Pedro Alvarez Cabral thought that he had reached this island in 1500, thus naming the country of Brazil. However, Cabral didn't choose the name Brazil. The country was at first named Ilha de Veracruz, Island of the True Cross, later Terra de Santa Cruz, Land of the Holy Cross, and still later, Brazil. The generally accepted theory states that it was renamed for the Brazil wood, which has an extreme red color, so Brazil derivated from Brasa Ember, a plant very valuable in Portuguese commerce and abundant in the newfound land. The most distinctive geographical feature of High Brazil is that it appears on the maps as a perfect circle, with a semicircular channel through the center. The central image of the Brazilian flag, a circle with a channel across the center, 
was the symbol for High Brazil on early maps. The circular perimeter of the island was confirmed by both Saints Berend and Brendan, who separately walked the shore to determine where the island ended, but never found it. Most likely they were walking in circles. One of the most famous visits to High Brazil was in 1674 by Captain John Nisbet of Kellybegs, County Donegal, Ireland. He and his crew were in familiar waters west of Ireland when a fog came up. As the fog lifted, the ship was dangerously close to the rocks. While getting their bearings, the ship anchored in three fathoms of water and four crew members rowed ashore to visit High Brazil. They spent the day on the island and returned with silver and gold that was given to them by an old man who lived there. The last supposed sighting was in 1872 by Roderick O'Flattery in a chronological description of West or H.I.R. Connick. He tells us of the reported old man by saying, There is now living Moro Ole, who imagines he was himself personally on O'Brazil for two days and saw out of it the lies of Aaron Golemhad, Irzohol, and other places in the West Continent he was acquainted with. The last documented sighting of High Brazil was in 1872 when author T.J. Westrop and several companions saw the island appear and then vanish. This was Mr. Westrop's third view of High Brazil, but on this voyage he had brought his mother to some friends to verify the island's existence. Whether or not the island exists or ever existed, it's still hard to tell, but the mythical and real accounts of the island are hard to deny. See what the mainstream has to tell us about this phenomena of ghost islands. And you can't get much more mainstream than National Geographic. Once considered a ghost, Bouvet Island was proven to exist 200 years after it was first spotted in 1739. Located 1,500 miles southwest of Africa, it is now a stop on some Antarctic cruises. Hmm, intriguing. And so they start this story, which they seem to be debunking these mythical ghost islands, by showing us that a ghost island was proven to be real, naturally. These fabled ghost islands exist only in atlases. Well, except for Bouvet Island, of course. Early map makers and explorers covered the seas with mythical lands. Here's where to find ones that turned out to be real. From the dawn of cartography, ghosts haunted our maps until modern technology purged them like a scientific exorcism. Brilliant wording in this article. Due to myth, miscalculation, optical illusion, or outright lies, because nobody lies today, which is fortunate for us, hundreds of non-existent land masses were planted on maps, where some remained for centuries. Up until the past decade, these erroneous listings prompted many futile and occasionally deadly ocean voyages by crews seeking treasure, fame, or virgin territory. High Brazil, supposedly located in the Atlantic Ocean west of Ireland, was said to render visitors immortal. Gamaland, east of Japan, drew sailors in search of its legendary gold and silver. The Phantom Sanikov land in Siberia even managed to vanish part of a Russian expedition crew. Although such specters have all but erased from maps, travelers can trace these mysterious tales by visiting cartographic libraries, monuments to explorers and map makers, and ghost islands that proved to be real. So, quite an interesting series of contradictions here. I guess we shouldn't expect anything less from the mainstream. Yes, they were just idiotic people who were incompetent, fell victim to optical illusion, believed lies, and therefore many of them just ended up seeing things that weren't really there. Of course, we start the article by showing that one was proven to really be there. So it makes you wonder, and of course it goes on to talk about the map making boom and everything else with it. I'll just cover this part claiming shadowy lands. These phantom islands spawned many problems for seafarers chasing these shadowy landmasses, according to Kevin Whitman, a researcher at Spain's Universidad de La Laguna, who completed his thesis on ancient maps. Oh, of course, thesis. This looks good. The, those expeditions were expensive and in some cases dangerous. Yes, because people just apparently had money to throw around then. And finding out that they were sailing to a place that doesn't exist was not good, don't you think? In the early 1900s, German explorer Baron Eduard Vazilek Toll led a mission to Sanikov land, first reported by a Russian ship in 1810, about 430 miles north of mainland Siberia. After Toll's vessel became trapped by ice in the new, Siber in the new Siberian lands, he and several colleagues used sledges and kayaks to head for Bennett Island, which tourists can now see on Arctic Ocean pleasure cruises. These explorers disappeared, as did Sanikov Land, which likely was just a mirage caused by Feta Morgana, according to Brooke Hitching. 
So intriguing, and you know, I really find it rich that uh, they show a satellite image of Bouvet Island. I mean, look at how pristine that image is. And then, of course, some 1929 archival image from Bouvet Island. At least that looks a little bit more real, but who knows what's really going on there. I find it very intriguing, though, that, again, there seems to be a lot of conflict in the mainstream account. They say that, yes, these islands were just Phantom Islands, and now it's the end of Phantom Islands because we have modern technology and science has completed its exorcism of that which we didn't like in the past. Really brilliant wording, and actually quite accurate to describe what's happened. But you have to wonder, did science complete some sort of exorcism? Or if one were to have the ability to control what directions, what corridors, and what travel routes that all the people could take, then could one make an account where they could dictate what lands are real and what lands are not? Or is that merely just a conspiracy theory? Not sure, but I think it's safe to say, though, that this does not in any way debunk the potential presence of more Phantom Islands and lands that are no doubt kept secret from our awareness. Well, let's head to our favorite Google Maps to take a look at this. Uh, yes, I love these wonderful, very photorealistic satellite images that we have. However, we see Ireland, and we recall the earlier explorations that we did to Skellig Islands, located here. And then we also remember how that played a role into the Battle of Ventry, which is where the King of the World rested for a while before he advanced his army, meeting the armies of the Fianna and the Tuatha Dé Danann in the Battle of Ventry. However, you have to wonder if High Brazil was located somewhere around here. Would it have been possible that this was some sort of gateway or some sort of interdimensional portal? Or perhaps there's a facet to the lands that we don't understand. Maybe this would explain why we have these Phantom Islands, why we have access. Why there's so many real accounts of these lands appearing and then disappearing. Maybe there is something more to the reality behind it. Also the name which evokes High King of the World means potentially that maybe this was a Ford staging base, High Brazil, for the King of the World, Daredone, before making his final advance to engage the armies of the Fianna and the Tuatha Dé Danann in his attempt to conquer Ireland. How does it all fit together? We have so many accounts of the actual existence of High Brazil and its location west of Ireland. We know that it could have been a perfect staging point for any sort of army or expeditionary force coming from the west, which is one of the most interesting aspects of the legend of Fionn McCool's battle with the King of the World, Dare Doan. But could there be other meanings behind it? The myth indicates that this is a mythical land and that it's a place where there's unbelievable prosperity and beauty beyond imagination. But we have to wonder, is reality somewhere in between? And what is the real nature of this island? Of course, the mainstream will dismiss it and tell us that it doesn't exist, and for all we know, they could be right. But there are too many accounts to ignore once again. We know that in Irish legend and myth, there seems to be a great deal of suppression that occurs, which is why it's very difficult sometimes to catalog Irish myth. And yet at the same time, there seem to be a lot of references to things that make sense and add up over the timelines. Especially when you consider the fact that uh, when the Tuatha Dé Danann were defeated, they were defeated by a people who had come from the fall of the Tower of Babel. So it all factors into legend and myth and our accounts of what we understand as a different kind of history. Perhaps a kind of history that we could trust a little bit more. Because we do know for a fact that there have been many issues with the mainstream account, which contradicts itself in an opening paragraph. However, I do wonder, going back to Tolkien's world in Arda, as he called it, he had many different physical existences for it. One was a flat world, or really more of a disc world in the Second Age. It had transitioned to a round world in the Third Age. And the only way that the elves could reach Valinor, the Undying Lands, was by sailing the straight road. And yet, is it really so extraordinary to think that there could be a realm or certain lands that potentially could be in some other dimension? 
that there has to be some other means of reaching instead of just simply physically going there. Perhaps it's some sort of technology we don't fully understand, or perhaps it's a mix of forces and technology that we don't fully understand. But who knows what our ancestors were truly capable of. It's intriguing to me that the mainstream likes to downplay our ancestors as being fools when it came to mapping the world, then at the same time they were able to achieve all these monumental architectural achievements in a century, the 19th century, when they didn't supposedly have many capabilities. It just seems to be convenient to whatever needs to fit the story being told, which is why we have to continuously question it. And yet I also wonder, could High Brazil have also been one of the lands that the Tuatha de Danann had inhabited or moved through when they moved from the four cities coming back to Ireland? There was a story that they had burned their ships when they reached Ireland, although there's even more what will be told are fantastical stories, that they flew to Ireland on some sort of airships. Again, we see this continuous legend that gets blended into what could be reality because we see people who are witnessing technology that they might not fully understand. What if that's really the case for the existence of High Brazil? And then we go back to the Battle of Ventry, which the more we look into the myth and the more we look into other myths, it seems to be an event that may have truly happened. It's often said that the Irish saved civilization, but is that really what happened? And of course that's stated because they preserved knowledge that was going to be lost during the medieval period or the dark ages. And yes, you've read the book and I've read the book and no, it was kind of a dry read. That's just my opinion on it. But I always thought there was a lot more to that saying. Perhaps the Battle of Entry had a lot more at stake than we realize. What would have been different for our realm if Deradon had defeated Fionn McCool and conquered Ireland, the last free land in the world? Something we're going to speculate on, and there'll be an upcoming video concerning the Battle of Entry. Where does that leave us with High Brazil? Is it just a legend or a myth? Is it something that's simply in the fairy tale imagination of many people in the history of Ireland? Or is there a reality to it? There are too many accounts once again to ignore, and I find it interesting that in the 19th century that always seems to be a cutoff period for where we had accounts and then all of a sudden the magical science of the 20th century suddenly validated or invalidated many of these so-called phantom islands. But I leave it to you, the viewer, to make your own decision on what you think the reality of High Brazil is. And I certainly invite you to let me know in the comments what you think it is. Well, as always, ask questions, explore yourself, and you'll restore the world. Thank you for joining me today. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Welcome to the Restituta Orbis channel, and today we're going to be exploring lands beyond the realm, journey to the unknown. We're going to consider what the physical limitations of our realm are, and what we're told they are, and is it possible to go beyond them? And if it were possible to transcend the physical limitations of our realm, what would we see? We're going to be looking at a series of pictures that were supposedly found in an old collection. Now I fully acknowledge that these pictures may not be authentic, they may not be genuine, they could be construed by any sort of means, but they do help us imagine what we could be looking at, and they do help us visualize what could be out there, beyond the known realm. And I find them very useful to inspire our creativity and imagination, because we have to wonder what really could be out there if it does exist. The limits of the realm are 
wondered about and we're told by our mainstream science that we're on a spinning ball and we're flying through space and we're part of a series of spinning balls flying around a large glowing spinning ball that's also flying through space. All that motion and it's as simple as that. And that may be the truth. However, there have been numerous indications that there are other forms of existence that we're not entirely aware of. And there have been attempts to depict different elements of our existence and understanding what it may be. It's safe to say that we do not exist in two dimension. We can say that's a fact and that's easy to prove. Yet at the same time, when we conduct all of our navigation, it's oftentimes done from a very flat screen or a flat map, and it's still effective. So what's the reality? How can there be evidence for both mentalities to be true at the same time? Both theories and both models. And yet people are oftentimes locked in eternal conflict about what's the right way to believe. Is it a round earth? Is it a flat earth? Is it something in between? Is it something else entirely? It could be all of these things. But when we look at the concept of Terra Infinita that came out in 2022. Now, Terra Infinita was another way of looking at the lands and the known lands and the lands beyond them from perhaps what some would consider a flat earth model. Or it could simply just be a map and a depiction. Because what's not depicted on here are the relief of mountains or the potential reality of craters or a ring of craters or something even beyond our ability to perceive. Remember that it's just a map and a map is just a way to visualize things. And the intriguing aspect about the Terra Infinita is that it took an old concept that we had a flat earth model that was surrounded by an ice wall and then there was an outer ring and an outer ring of lands outside of that ice wall. And it was a new way of looking at it. And the individual that composed Terra Infinita in 2022 labeled the lands in different ways and provided some portals through the known lands to reach these unknown lands in the outer rings of existence. Now, are these physical portals or are these some other portal that we couldn't possibly understand? It's hard to say. Again, it's something else that could be both. It could be neither. Maybe you pass through these portals by transcending the physical realm, perhaps at a physical death, or maybe your mind's able to reach a state that you were able to project yourself in an avatar in some other realm. All of these things may be possible. It sounds like science fiction, and yet we have so much evidence through our own religious beliefs, our own spirituality, and years of observations that indicate it could be all of these beliefs at the same time. The Terra Infinita model allows us to visualize what it could be like to pass through the realm to other lands. And that's why it's so intriguing to us. Also, it really has no limitations. As you see in the center, the small map that we just looked at is but one realm. The name comes from itself. There are infinite realms. And that's really the unique aspect of the concept. Now again, there have been belief systems that have posited this for decades and centuries before, supposedly, this concept was recently introduced. But regardless, it's intriguing when you think about this depiction that there are so many different realms and so many different levels of existence. What does it really mean for us? What if existence is truly unbounded? We're going to stay to the prospect of physical existence in this exploration, and we're going to consider what it may be to go to the lands beyond. But another way to look at the Terra Infinita realm is this very rudimentary and simplistic depiction, that you have a series of lands, and here in this depiction, they're divided by ice, and then you have another land set. Now you could say it's within a crater, a crater within the ice, and there's also the crater earth theory, and that's a valid theory as well. It's amazing the amount of possibilities that could be our reality. And we can see it just in looking at these maps. When we look at some of these remarkable photos, we're told that these photos were found in some old explorer's collection. 
and the mainstream and others will no doubt tell us that these are not real photos that they are comprised using any number of means of trickery and what was available at the time but imagine if there were a world imagine if there were a world where you had something like this giant fungus giant biological life forms flora and fauna beyond colossal imagination what exactly is in this picture i mean are these structures are these some sort of plants that are beyond our ability to imagine it's all a series of intriguing concepts and yet we can't ignore the fact that it does depict a world that could exist and we can see it as existing Yet it's so strangely different from the one that we're aware of. Even the natural world that we think of, where we believe that we understand everything that we're looking at and what it could really mean. Moving on to the next one, we see another large mushroom or tree. You can't even begin to describe or imagine what this plant could be. Or could it be something else colossal beyond our ability to understand? Something that only exists in the lands beyond our known lands. And what indications do we have that there are lands beyond our known lands, aside from these photographs? We have many accounts from our myth and our legends that there are other lands and other creatures that are beyond our imagination now. Of course, we'll be told that these were simply the imagination and uneducated superstitious beliefs of our distant ancestors, and as always, they had no idea what they were doing which doesn't really preclude well to our current existence. However, that's what we're told. When you look at something like this, you have to wonder, is there a place where something like this could exist? Is it possible? And if it were possible, then what does it mean for these lands? And if these lands were reached by somebody and they were photographed, then how was it done? Those are all very important questions. This next image, we see what looks to be sort of a combination of a rock structure with a disc and almost in a pyramid. And it's baffling to us. Is this something that was made through natural means or is this a combination of natural and artificial means? We see signs for both in this image. It makes it intriguing to wonder what kind of world this would be with a civilization that exists that's much more in tune or perhaps some perhaps it possesses some ability to both manipulate and integrate with the natural state of plants and organic life forms as part of its structures there are a lot of theories that go about that many of our older structures and even the whole concept of granite that there is a natural life component to it and that's what gives it its tremendous strength and its endurance for centuries and even beyond. Then in this image we see the same thing, that mixture of both the organic and the inorganic. An incredible series of structures reaching up to the sky and yet we see rooms and doors that seem to be hollowed out of these structures, giving them an artificial component. One can't help but be reminded of the fairy chimneys of Cappadocia when you look at these images. Could it be that somewhere out there beyond our known lands there is a civilization or group of people that has achieved this and still lives like this to this day? And there seem to be no limits to what they could achieve. And yet it also gives us hints to how some of these impossible edifices that we examine in our explorations every week could have been achieved. If there were other powers to other creatures and their ability to fabricate such amazing structures using both a biological and an artificial component. That's where we start to glean an understanding for how such things could be possible. And perhaps the mysteries that we've, see, that we've sought answers for could have their answers in the outer realm. The how that we always seek to answer the question why. Those are just the structures, though. 
we also have to consider the life forms. And we do have some unique photographic evidence, allegedly, of a tremendous variance of life forms. And we'll be told the same thing by the mainstream, that this isn't possible, this shouldn't exist. Is this some sort of strange creature that doesn't make a lot of sense? Is this some sort of hominid that didn't fully evolve? Or is this just photographic fakery? Well, we know what we'll be told. But we have many accounts even in our more contemporary history of crypto cryptids as we like to call them or animals that don't make any sense we've had sightings such as the mothman and that'll be written off to simply mass hysteria and there's always a legitimate rational explanation yet there are too many examples of this to ignore on the same token, though, our mainstream will tell us, or it will not out and out deny, the possibility of aliens. One of the most interesting things about aliens, though, when you consider them, is the fact that in every depiction and in every image that we have, they seem to resemble humans in many ways. They have arms and legs, they are symmetrical, they have eyes, in a lot of cases they have noses and mouths. And we wonder when we're told by geniuses like Carl Sagan about the infinite possibilities of evolution and evolution taking millions and millions of years, how is it another life form on another planet with completely different circumstances could have evolved to be anywhere near what our form is? That never made any sense to me. I mean, I understand on Star Trek The Next Generation, it was simply a cost-saving measure just to use the forehead makeup. Makes sense. It was always amazing that the original series seemed to have more imaginative aliens despite having a smaller budget, but that just goes to show you. Yet, when we look at the concept of something such as blimmies, which are documented in our supposed official history, although we're told that it's just myth and it was simple superstition by explorers not knowing what to expect, we're even told that Christopher Columbus expected to find blimmies when he came to the New World, although the historiosity of Christopher Columbus is definitely open for debate. The thing I find interesting about blimmies is that they look far more alien than any of the depictions of aliens that were given. So what's the reality? Well, perhaps blimmies do exist, and perhaps they do exist in the lands beyond. I also think of the many reports that we have of ball lightning and other unexplained phenomena in the sky. Why is it they want the UFO concept to persist? Are they trying to explain something that the mainstream can't explain? One of the things we have to be weary of is someone who claims to know everything and have all the answers. And I always found it interesting how we can know so much about things that we say are either so far away or so distant in the past. Not just a million years, but a billion years. We have a perfectly good idea of what happened hundreds of millions of years ago. And to even question that means you're a fool. Or we know exactly what happens in a galaxy that's 200 million light years away, even though the light from that galaxy supposedly takes 200 million years to reach us. And we have not traveled with manned space exploration by our official accounts even beyond our own moon. So how do we really know? I've always wondered if these phenomena that we see, the, this ball lightning and this unexplained atmospheric phenomena, if it's really hinting towards something else. Perhaps these are portals or some method of existence where we can access other physical realms and we're seeing it manifested. Or it's just something beyond our explanation or it's simply an incredible atmospheric effect and it's potentially a source for energy. When we look and we consider the explorations that we've been doing, we have to remember that there are many possible explanations for what we see. And we always have to keep our minds open. The fact that there may be other lands beyond our realm is something that's important to consider because it could answer the question for why we have so many unexplained things within our own realm that we can see every day, right down to the courthouse in your local town and how it was actually constructed and when. Well, as always, ask questions, explore yourself, and you restore the world. Please like, comment, and subscribe.
the sun, the great solar luminary, the very device that illuminates our world, our lands, every day. Even when it's a cloudy day, we know that the sun is still there, bathing us in its amazing light. And even science says that the sun has tremendous properties, that it provides for all life on the planet. We look back to the various origins of our civilization, our society. We even had a great unifying religion about the sun. I recognize that within the symbol for the channel, Restitutor Orbis, Restorer of the World. It's a reference to the religion that worshipped the sun called Sol Invictus, or Sun Unconquered. What's really the nature of the sun? Why is it so important to us, and what does it really mean? We're also going to examine what's the actual color of the sun. And you may be asking, why is that such an imperative question? Well, I've come across many explorers, myself included, who can recall a time when the sun appeared yellow. Not just at dawn or at sunset, but throughout the entire day. And yet, when we look at the sun during midday or at any point during its traversing through the sky, we see this. A white-looking sun. Why do we see a white sun? Did something change? Or are our memories simply faulty? Are we remembering things incorrectly? Do we not see things the way that they really are? Or has something truly changed that we're not aware of? We're told by science that it is a common misconception that the sun is yellow or orange or even red. And looking from our friends from the Solar Center at Stanford, they'll reference it and they'll tell us that when you look at the sun through space, the sun is essentially all colors mixed together, which appear to our eyes as white. This is easy to see in pictures taken from space. Well, of course it's easy to see in pictures taken from space. And yet, in the earlier picture we just looked at, we saw that the sun appeared white as well. Are they going to tell us that, well, if you're at a high enough altitude, the sun will appear white? I can tell you that when I looked at the sun today, carefully of course, it appeared white to me, especially around midday. And what does the sun look like to you? What color do you see it as? Well, of course, science will give us their explanations, and apparently, if you go into space, you're going to see the sun looking like this. Of course, once again, this is a photograph, an image, so we're seeing a representation of what the sun looks like. It's also difficult in the fact that you can't really look directly at the sun, and you probably shouldn't. But nevertheless, it is a benchmark for our entire lifetime to always look at the sun and be aware of it. Apparently, going into space is easy, though, to look at the sun. If we look at what the Fast and the Furious movies have come to, all you need is a Pontiac Friero. And you can modify it accordingly. You can go into space and look at the sun yourself. At least that's what the fiction of those movies would have us believe. But we know that space travel is not exactly the easiest thing. Whether you believe in its veracity or not, what we're told by the official narrative is that space travel is very difficult. And there's a reason why we have not gone back to the moon in many decades. And we're only just now going back to it. <sighs> you remember when The Fast and the Furious was actually about underground car racing? And the very first movie was just an independent movie? Hmm. It was also the movie that uh, brought to notoriety the great Toyota Super Mark IV, because prior to The Fast and the Furious, this may surprise many viewers, nobody knew about it. Okay, I digress. Rainbows are light from the sun, says our friends from Stanford. Separated into its colors, each color in the rainbow, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet has a different wavelength. Red is the longest, blue is the shortest. Now, ask yourself this question. When you look at the rainbow, what do you really see? Do you really see that incredible mixture of colors, or do you see something else? It's almost as though we're playing a mind game here with what colors we actually see. And it's true that there may be different perceptions. Some people may have different perceptions within their eyes. Their eyes have a particular physical aspect to them that they may see different colors. Of course, traditionally they called this people who were colorblind, who may have a red-green or a blue-green issue. 
However, you talk to many people and you tend not to see all these colors in a rainbow. And even in this picture here, we really only see maybe two or three obvious colors. Now, of course, we can say it's a bad picture. Different rainbows have different colors. But again, it feels like we're just being told something that's to keep us satisfied. To keep us from asking more questions or not to even consider this. And yet I think many of us and many people I've talked to, whether they're... Oh no. Well, it is good to be on the channel again. And since you were exploring the sun and the sun being a star, I thought that I would show up to give you the scientific explanation of what the star really is. Carl, Carl, careful. You're getting a little close here. It's a little uncomfortable. Just relax. I am going to explain to your viewers what the real situation is. You see, we are all made of star stuff. Therefore, because we are all made of star stuff, we can help the universe glean an understanding of what it really is. And with my infinite wisdom, you and your viewers can understand why the sun appears the way that it does. And I assure you that there is a rational scientific explanation. It's not because anything has changed with the nature of what you see with the sun or the star that it is. Do you know that when I originally got into the study of astronomy, it was from looking at a book about stars? Well, I'm here to explain it all to you and your viewers about what you see and why you see what you see. You simply have to be patient and accept my explanation. Look, Carl, will you just get to the point? Please just get to the point, all right? This isn't Cosmos. All right, the electromagnetic spectrum. You see, there are some lights that you can see, and there are lights that you cannot see. There are gamma rays, there are x-rays, and there's ultraviolet light. These are lights that you may not be able to see. So you see, only special scientific equipment can allow you to look at these amazing images, but you cannot see them with your naked eye. Allow me to elucidate. Oh, please, don't, don't keep me in suspense. Scientific instruments can sometimes detect light that our eyes cannot. When people want to look at those, say, x-ray or ultraviolet images, they need to color them something that our eyes can detect. So the scientists pick some bright color, a color that would never be confused with viewing the sun in white light. That way, we know from seeing a picture of a neon green or bright red sun that the image was actually taken in some non-seeable version of light, such as extreme ultraviolet or x-rays. You know, Carl, it sounds like you're really just talking in circles, and that's kind of what I expect the scientific explanation. Silence! Let me finish. It is hard for many people, even scientists, except for myself, of course, to admit that the sun they are so used to living with is actually white. So sometimes they even color pictures of the sun taken invisible or white light to look more like something we would expect. Below is a picture of the sun taken invisible white light, but which a scientist have processed to make it appear orange for our benefit. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, Carl, hold on. Before we look at that image, you're admitting that these images of the sun are being altered. So if these images of the sun are altered, listen, sometimes the display color of the sun is culturally determined. You see, this is culture. If a kindergartner in the USA colors a picture of the sun, they will usually make it yellow. However, a kindergartner in Japan would normally color it red. And perhaps if you're from some other part in the world, you would make it purple or blue. In spite of these artistic licenses, the sun really is white. And you are really made of star stuff. It's a fact. Well, Carl, I don't think it's a fact because you just admitted earlier that this image that we're looking at is an image that was modified. This is not a real representation of the sun. This is a modified image. Strangely enough, many images that we get seem like they're modified. Whatever we're looking at. Whenever it comes to, you know, looking at that place called space. Where you are right now, of course. Listen, I think you're being disrespectful towards my assertions. No, 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 no. I'm not being disrespectful towards your assertions. I'm just trying to ask some questions here. We're really trying to get to the bottom of why the sun appears the way it does. And you're telling us that you have to have special scientific equipment to really see the sun the way that you say it should be seen, which is really white. But we're also admitting that when we look up to the sky, we do see a white sun. So which is it, Carl? I'm a little confused here with your scientific explanation. Look, I, uh, okay, Carl, I think that's enough, all right? We, we appreciate your contribution. I think you laid out what you wanted to say. So what's it really come down to? What do we really see when we look at the sun? Many of us remember the sun being yellow, 
And we remember the sun being yellow when different images are taken of it. And you see the incredible pattern that's formed when pictures are taken of the sun at the same time of day across a year. You also see an image to the right of what the sun, we believe traditionally, looked like, which is yellow or gold. But what's really the answer behind what the sun actually looks like? Because I know that when I look at the sun at midday, it does appear white. And yet, sunrise and sunset, you still see that golden yellow sun. Is there an explanation for this? Is there a certain time frame where people can remember the sun being yellow all day long? I mean, I can remember the sun seeming like it was yellow all day long, decades ago. And it seemed like there was a difference in the clouds and even the illumination of the lands. And one of the reasons that I dismissed Carl is, you know, he already had the scientific explanation. And of course, they're going to tell us what they think we want to hear, which is, well, we, we have an explanation for everything. But when we look at past images of the sun, our ancestors and from our supposed history, it was always depicted as yellow. The religion of Sol Invictus depicted it as yellow with a face and other images depicted the sun as yellow with a face. So what's the real answer behind it? It seems as though, looking back historically, the sun was always perceived as yellow. And yes, I suppose Japan is one of those perceptions where the sun could be seen as red, as it's on their flag. But that seems to be the exception and not the rule, because everywhere else you look, and whoever you talk to, and I think yet again it's another attempt to induce a cultural divide, which I certainly don't support. I mean, what do we actually see? What do we perceive when we look at it? Without images. Because we're always told that we need to have some sort of interpretation behind everything. And I don't know about you, viewer, but I get tired of all these interpretations we need to have. What's wrong with trusting our own perceptions? And at the same time, I will admit, it is possible our perceptions could be flawed. We have to be aware of that. Our memories may be off, or Maybe we really aren't seeing what's really up there. And yet you look at this image, and this is an image that uh, was from a Japanese depiction, and yet here it looks like the sun is more of a yellow, even bordering on white, but it's certainly not red. Now, you, if you look, you'll certainly find plenty of other images to include the flag where it's red. But why is it such a big deal? Why do we concern ourselves with something like this? For many people, it's a sign that there is something different about the lands, the realm, or the world. When many people think that they can remember a yellow sun in times past, they have to wonder if there's a reason for that. Could it be evidence of another world, and evidence of certain people jumping between worlds at certain times, through some means that we do not understand? We also have other representations of the sun, the very symbol of Sol Invictus on the left, and then another older symbol on the right, and yet it's always gold, gold associated with yellow, that color that historically we remember the sun being. And yet now, I think most of us when we look up, see a white sun, especially at midday. But at sunrise and sunset, you can still see a very clear yellow sun or a golden sun, like was depicted here. Is there a meaning behind this? And I open it up to you, viewers. What do you think? What's your perception of what you see? Is there another explanation to this? Are we just remembering it incorrectly? Or is there something more behind this? Something more that we can't quite explain, but we can perceive that somehow something has changed? There's also an aspect I haven't covered yet, and the fact that this may be tied to a deeper intuition that we all possess within our minds. Some of us have said that we can feel that things have changed in ways that we may not be able to perceive with our physical senses, and yet one of the aspects is considering the sun, that it may have changed from yellow to white at midday, that the lighting or illumination of all the lands has changed, that things appear differently. And many people you talk to will tell you that clouds looked very different in decades past. So is this indicative of the fact that there are groups of people or that there are people who've had different experiences and have different memories? Strangely enough, I don't really come across many people who I talk to to reminisce about times before the year 2000, 2001,
who remember the sun being white in those years. Once you get past that, it seems to vary. There's a movie I'd like to refer to, a very, very brilliant science fiction movie from the 1980s in New Zealand called The Quiet Earth. The Quiet Earth is about a scientist who is conducting an experiment or part of an experiment in New Zealand. And I'm not going to ruin it for you because I truly recommend this movie. It is very well made and it is very entertaining. And it's certainly a very wonderful movie that showcases New Zealand cinema quite well. But one of the opening scenes of the movie involves seeing the sunrise. And when you watch the movie, consider what you see when you watch the scene of the sunrise. And then consider what happens with the plot that follows. Now, I'll just give you some hints about the plot. So you can consider it if you watch it or if you decide to look up the synopsis. But it does involve a gateway or a transition between worlds. And the movie has one of the best endings I think I've ever seen in a science fiction movie. And it does a very good job of building up high concept science fiction where it's really trying to look into the thought that goes into what the experiment is, what's the nature of existence, and it's a brilliant blend of both science and philosophical pursuits. And yes, I do believe there is a legitimate science, a legitimate science of exploration and having theories and validating or invalidating them, going to other theories and finding other explanations. And this is the image, and granted this isn't taken from the movie, but it's similar to the opening image from the movie. You have to wonder if there is something being reflected in the meaning of the rising sun and what it refers to. There's also an interesting symbol that you see if you watch the movie in the opening scene of the sun rising. So, this exploration is probably a lot more philosophical than most of us are used to, and yet I think it's an important exploration because it's one of the most basic facets of our existence, which is what we see and what the natural light or illumination of our lands comes from. Now, I know some other explorations have touched on this, and there have been other researchers who've looked into this, but I wanted to give my own perceptions of it because I can tell you there are many people that I've talked to who will give you different years when they can remember the sun going from yellow to white at midday. And that's a very intriguing set of variances in my mind because is it showing that there are people who've had different individual experiences despite all of us being on the same land? Well, of course, science tells us that, well, the sun is every color and it's no color, but it's white. You just need to look at it through space. If you're not looking at it through space, then you'll see whatever color you really want to see. And that seems to be their catch-all for it. But we have to wonder, is that the true explanation? And here we have another one of these modified images that shows a sunspot activity. How exactly does one come across one of these modified images? Well, I'm sure there are people who tell me in the comments that you just need the right scientific equipment, look at it through the right viewing apparatus, and you will see exactly an image like this. And it's not modified. Rest assured, these are not modified images. Even though you'll find plenty of accounts, as we saw earlier, that the images are modified. So what's it really come down to? Well, ultimately it comes down to your perception and what you feel is going on with the sun. Is it as science tells us that it's every color and it's really white and would you see to look at it in space, provided we could get to space or who actually gets to space? Or is there something more going on? Is the variance in observations and memories of the sun and its color some sort of evidence that we're at some sort of intersection of many different worlds that maybe some of us somehow came from another world, another time or another place. And maybe that's why many of us don't feel that we belong in this world. It's hard to say, but I certainly invite all the feedback and whatever your feelings are. Is a scientific explanation correct or do we really see a difference? Well, as always, thank you for joining me. Ask questions, explore yourself, and you'll restore the world. Please like, comment, and subscribe.